In my last video, I went over all of the different load sensing options within Holly EFI. You have a handful of options that all have their own advantages and disadvantages. The three primary types being speed density, volumetric efficiency, and alpha N. Alpha N is rarely used and really only used in extreme applications. And generally speaking, for people watching a how to tune Holly for beginners video are probably not gonna find themselves in a situation where they're gonna be using alpha N. And if you are doing your first car in alpha N, you might even wanna consider maybe finding an easier car to do for your first few and then work your way up to it. Alpha N, generally speaking, is far more difficult and a lot of that is because the cars and the setups that you're using Alpha N in are very extreme and, and very difficult to work with. I am a firm believer that volumetric efficiency is the way to go. That does not mean that I'm right and you're wrong or whoever's doing your tuning is right and wrong. There's no right and wrong here. It's just all personal preference. I'm gonna try and go into a little bit of detail here as to why I find volumetric efficiency to be my preferred method. If you feel the same, then by all means use it. And if you think I'm an idiot, I'm used to that. So at that point, you're probably gonna to wanna to look into speed density. I'm sure if you were to search, there's an endless amount of videos that probably describe the same topic. Maybe not Holly specific, but they're definitely out out there and if you actually try googling some of the math on what's going on in the volumetric efficiency calculation you see it gets really complex and there's actually a lot of different theories on how it all works different parts of the world are using different units of measurement and uh, the math can get ugly my intention with this video is not to bore you with a whole bunch of math because you're never going to actually do the math but to give you a basic and hopefully a beginner friendly understanding of what's actually going on. This is one of the situations where making videos like this becomes a lot harder than you would expect. I could sit here and talk to somebody about this for three hours, no questions asked, but when you sit down and you try and film a video, you're, you're trying to think and say four different things at the same time. And then after you're done and you watch it, you always realize that you forgot to say about 80 things that you wanted to say. At the same time, you need to keep these videos relatively short. If you're interested enough to be watching this video, you've probably heard an engine being referred to as an air pump before. And that's exactly what we're doing with this load sensing calculation. So we're trying to figure out how efficient the air pump or the engine is. So basically we're bringing our air into the intake manifold, filling the cylinders of the engine, and then the air is passing into the exhaust system. In a perfect world, if we could measure the air coming into the engine, you could simply do the math and know exactly what the volumetric efficiency of the engine is at that point. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury, so we have to go about it a little bit different way. So for the VE-based load sensing method to work, uh, first and foremost, we need to choose VE-based as our load sensing type. We need to correctly enter our engine size, and then we need to correctly characterize our fuel injectors. That was gonna mean both the latency or the offset time here, and then also the fuel flow rate. And the fuel flow rate needs to be correct based off of the fuel pressure. So these injectors here are rated at 42 pounds per hour at 43 pounds of fuel pressure. So if we have 60 pounds of fuel pressure, you can see here that the injector flow rate change. The other thing that is extremely important, regardless of which load sensing type you're using, but it's heavily used in our volumetric efficiency calculation is gonna be your MAP sensor, and then also your manifold air temperature sensor. So your manifold air temperature sensor needs to be in a spot that makes sense. You'd be amazed kind of where these things end up. So for the guys that zip tie the air temperature sensor to a radiator hose, you might be reading air temperature is that much higher than what's actually happening. And then in forced induction applications, whether it's pre-intercooler, post-intercooler, things of that nature is gonna read totally different. So in a perfect world, we want this to read the temperature of the air that's entering the engine. So if we look at our actual fuel table, you see the other axis is the engine RPM. So obviously we're gonna need engine RPM for the engine to run regardless. And then the last part of the equation is going to be target air fuel ratio. So unlike speed density, our target air fuel ratio is actually part of the mathematical equation when delivering fuel in VE mode. I'll come back and touch on this later, but just that in itself is a big reason why I like to use VE. So even though we're getting ready to do a whole bunch of math to calculate airflow, the end goal isn't necessarily that we're interested in the airflow. We're just using the airflow to characterize the fuel flow. And the airflow and the fuel flow directly relate to one another. So by calculating the airflow, we're gonna have a very good estimation on calculating the fuel flow. 
And then once we're done with all of the math, we're actually able to verify that our math is correct through the tailpipe and using the wideband oxygen sensor. Here's the part where we start explaining what's actually happening and what some of these numbers mean. Imagine you have a container, like a box, or in this case, a, a cylinder. So in the case of a six liter engine, we have like 366 cubic inches of space available. So again, if we could measure the air coming into the engine, if we had 100% volumetric efficiency, we have 366 cubic inches coming in. Generally speaking, most engines are only capable of running a maximum of 100% volumetric efficiency, but more often than not, they're gonna run slightly less than that. In some instances of the case of exhaust scavenging, you can get slightly more than 100%. And if any of the injector data, the engine size, any of those other sensors, any of that information is incorrect, or even in the case of an ECU doing math that isn't 100% correct, you might actually see table values that are over 100%. But in a perfect world, perfect scenario, everything working correctly, figure a naturally aspirated engine is going to run at basically a maximum of 100% or very close to it. The other side of that is that you can argue that the actual fuel entering the engine, the fuel density itself can take up space, uh, which again would decrease volumetric efficiency as, as less air is able to enter the cylinder. So if we take that same example, again, 366 cubic inches of air entering and exiting the engine would be 100% volumetric efficiency. If 350 cubic inches entered a 366 cubic inch cylinder, then we're gonna have 95% volumetric efficiency. And that's basically a rundown of, of ultimately the main goal and where that percentage number equals. Again, all of the, the information that we entered, including the air temperature, so on and so forth, it's all gonna play a role in, in coming up with that number. But in a nutshell, that's ultimately what we're after. Again, depending on what you read, how much you dig into this, you will find conflicting results. But there's two trains thought that the volumetric efficiency of the engine can change with forced induction. And then there's other side of it that it cannot. I have found that most forced induction engines are gonna have VE numbers that are higher than if you took the same car, the same parts, and did not have any sort of forced induction. However, the numbers aren't gonna change as much as you might think. So if at 100 kPa or one atmosphere, your engine is running at 100% volumetric efficiency. If you add 15 pounds of boost or essentially another additional 100 kPa and additional atmosphere, your VE numbers are not gonna go to 200%. You know, they might go up to 110, 115, something like that. So you're gonna see a small difference, but it's definitely not a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you dig through the arguments and you dig through both sides of it, I can agree with both. Again, you're not gonna actually do any of this math yourself. That's why we have the ECU. So I've never real necessarily cared too much about the math and, and the breakdown of it. But if you have a, an understanding of how it works, uh, you can very quickly look at a volumetric efficiency table in an ECU and tell if something is wrong. So if your table values are 300%, then either you have a fuel supply issue or some of your initial setup information is not correct. If we look at a fuel table and a tune-up and we see we have 140, 150% volumetric efficiency, it's pretty easy to look at that and be like, eh, probably not, but it's still in the ballpark. You can still work with it. It's not like that once the volumetric efficiency numbers get skewed a little bit that you gotta scrap the whole idea and switch over to speed density. So the reality of it is, is if your VE numbers are incorrect, your fuel flow numbers and speed density are also going to be incorrect as well. There's usually something on the setup side of things that is causing that discrepancy, and you'll find it in both things. But um, for me personally, when we're dealing with a system that's basically one to 100 or give or take, it's very easy to look at the table and be able to tell if things are, are in the ballpark as where if you go over to speed density and you're looking at pounds per hour, uh, since I don't use it all of the time, I'd have to do math to be able to figure out if we're in the ballpark or not. Now, I'm sure there's guys that have been doing holly and speed density for many, many years, and they'll look at a table and they'll be able to, to tell you if it's right or not right off of the bat. But I think it would take a lot more time to develop that skill set to do that. One more thing to take into consideration when talking about turbochargers and engine volumetric efficiency 
is that the turbocharger itself has its own efficiency ranges. So you might see that when you go from five PSI to 10 PSI, there might be a small difference in fuel requirement change. But when you go from 20 PSI to 25 PSI, that, that range might change a lot due to the efficiency of the turbocharger. And then as you get into higher boost levels, the turbo starts becoming inefficient. You'll see it go the other direction, especially at higher RPM, you'll see the fuel table tank. Now, a lot of that is the engine volumetric efficiency hasn't changed. It's that the turbocharger efficiency has changed. We just don't have another way of making offsets for that unless maybe you added an exhaust manifold back pressure sensor or maybe a compressor speed sensor. And then you could build custom tables to offset the difference in the turbocharger efficiency without having to actually change the fuel table efficiency. Different systems like MoTeC, uh, you can actually have map over EMAP as an axis uh, that makes things really easy. But again, that's all advanced stuff that's, that's far outside of this video. And the reality of it is, is 99% of the people are getting by with, with just this. So just because you're changing the fuel table numbers to offset what the turbocharger is doing, it doesn't necessarily matter. It might, maybe it's not ideal if crazy altitude swings or something like that. But generally speaking for just about everybody doing it this way is gonna be just fine. Now, regardless if you're using volumetric efficiency or speed density for your load sensing, anytime you're performing modifications to your engine, whether that's camshafts, headers, air intakes, intake manifolds, whatever it is, regardless of how you're characterizing the fuel requirements, the objective of those aftermarket parts is to increase the volumetric efficiency of the engine. The more efficient it is, the more air is gonna go into the engine, the more air is gonna come out of the engine, and ultimately the more horsepower we're gonna make. So even if you don't want anything to do with this volumetric efficiency calculation, it's still happening whether you want it to or not if you're trying to increase horsepower with the engine. Now probably the biggest influence on volumetric efficiency that there is is the actual throttle body. The whole purpose of the throttle body is just to kill volumetric efficiency. I don't know if you've ever started a car with a broken throttle body or stuck throttle but as soon as you uh, turn the key the thing just wants to shoot up to the rev limiter and give you a heart attack. Uh, so the throttle body's purpose is to to make everything manageable and it's a big factor, I guess you could say indirectly, when using a volumetric efficiency fuel table because we have manifold pressure as one axis and RPM on the other axis, as opposed to having throttle position as our axis. However, the throttle dictates both RPM and manifold pressure directly. So you can see here in this example, uh, you know, down here in the idle ranges, we have somewhere in the, you know, the mid 40s for volumetric efficiency uh, as we increase with RPM you can see that the volumetric efficiency rises to a point. Uh, and then as we go up, you can see, uh, you know, from here, it continuously rises until we get to a point where it sort of flatlines. So again, all of these table values are the efficiency of the engine in percentage. So basically what we're trying to do here is we're trying to characterize and say, okay, at 2000 RPM at 14 pounds of boost, we're saying that the engine is 70% efficient. Now, if we take that value, we go over to our target air fuel ratio table, 2000 at what, somewhere around here, uh, we choose our target air fuel ratio. We run the engine at that point, then we go to our data log and we check and see what our actual air fuel ratio is versus what our commanded air fuel ratio is. If that number is wrong by whatever percentage, then we would have to come back into our fuel table and make corrections. Uh, once our air fuel ratio and our target air fuel ratio match, then we know that that particular point in the fuel table is correct and then we can move on. As you get better at doing this, you're not gonna have to go cell by cell by cell. You know, generally speaking, if you need X amount of fuel at a given throttle position um, and you give it more throttle, so you're gonna increase engine RPM, you're gonna increase load, then usually the fuel values are gonna go up. Whatever shit sounds fat to me, that's just what I love. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I find it very easy to predict how much more that's gonna be in volumetric efficiency mode, more so than I do in speed density mode. Uh, the numbers are very similar 
for basically every car and every engine. I would say that this particular map that we're looking at right here, the numbers are a decent amount lower than normal. Uh, usually these values are gonna get closer to 100 or maybe even over 100. But that's another thing that's nice about volumetric efficiency is that even though this map seems to be off a little bit, the actual numbers are very small in terms of what they could be if you are off by the same amount with speed density in pounds per hour. The process of building out your VE table is a whole lot of trial and error. Once you understand how this stuff works, you understand you're probably gonna be 40 or 50% VE in most applications in your idle range. It's going to increase from there uh, with RPM and load. And then you figure at 100 kPa, you're gonna be 90, 100%, whatever you know that particular engine wants to do at peak torque, and then it's typically going to follow the torque curve from there. So if torque drops off, your VE table is gonna drop off. You put some baseline numbers into the table, you drive it, you measure your actual air fuel, you divide it by your target air fuel, and whatever that difference is, is how far off you are. You make those changes to the table, and you try it again. Again, the numbers are very small, so theoretically, you can only be off by so many percent. So let's just say for sake of conversation, your first go at it, you're off by 10%. Make your changes to your fuel table, now you're off by 3%. Make a couple changes, now you're zero to 1%. So you can really eliminate a lot of repetitiveness of having to change a table over and over and over again. And again, you know, there's guys that work in pounds per hour on a daily basis, and they're probably able to get the math a lot closer a lot quicker than maybe what I'm making it sound out to be. So again, if you prefer pounds per hour, by all means use it. I like VE. So to give you an example of the math side of that, so if our actual air fuel ratio is 12.5, our target air fuel ratio is 13 to one, that gives us 0.96. So basically that would be 96%, or you could say that we are 4% too rich. Uh, the nice part about Holly, and uh, if you've watched any of my other videos, you see I use the closed loop fuel correction uh, to do a lot of the math for me. So in this case, you'd, the closed loop compensation would have been negative 4%. So then we could highlight whatever part of the map, multiply it by 0.96. Yeah, then our, our map should be very close. One thing to be aware of is if you're really far off, like if you have a 15 or a 20% fuel correction, you're probably not gonna wanna take all 20% out. So if I had a 20% correction, I'd probably take 16% or 17%. You'll you just see that that's the way that the math wants to work out. So just something to keep in mind. So I figured I would sort of make a list of pros and cons of using volumetric efficiency versus speed density. And we'll start off by, you have a rough idea of what the volumetric efficiency of any engine is going to be. So with that being said, you can do a majority of the work. You can build a fuel table, you know, just from your couch before you ever have to connect to a car. Yes, you can kind of technically do the same thing with speed density if you know how much power the car is gonna make. But if you're not sure what, the, what power the car is gonna make, then you're just totally blindly guessing. The only way to get close is to make a run, see how far off you are, you know, rinse, repeat, and see how many times you need to do that. The other thing with doing it that way with speed density is you might know that the car is going to make a thousand horsepower at 25 pounds of boost. So that makes the full throttle stuff pretty easy. But what about at 40% throttle at 80 kPa at 3200 RPM? Like how much horsepower is the car going to make there? That number is going to be a whole lot more difficult to figure out as to where if we put 60 or 70% into a volumetric efficiency table, I guarantee you that the thing's gonna run, assuming that all of our injector information and all of the other things that we discussed are correct. Uh, so it just makes it a lot easier to get into the ballpark very quickly. But what sort of goes hand in hand with that is that most VE tables are very similar. Like yes, the shape is gonna change. Yes, the numbers are gonna change up and down a little bit. But generally speaking, you could take a thousand horsepower VE table and load it into a 350 horsepower car, assuming that they're you know, the same induction and, and the scaling is the same for the map sensor and RPM. And it's going to be pretty close. It's gonna start the car, it's gonna run it. Just generally speaking, a thousand horsepower car, everything's gonna be shifted over to the right. Turbo is gonna come in a lot lazier as to where if you have a 350 horsepower turbo car, everything's gonna be kind of shifted over to the left. You will find that, you know, a two liter engine uh, versus six liter engine, the volumetric efficiency is gonna be relatively similar. Uh, just the shape of the curve is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, two liter engines don't really make much of anything at 3000 RPM uh, as to where a six liter is going to make a lot. But again, the table value numbers are gonna be the same. You're just gonna shape that curve differently. Even with that being said, you're still gonna be 
pretty close as to where, you know, with fuel flow value numbers might be a whole different ball game. If you never tuned a two liter Honda engine or something like that, you might have no clue in the world how much power it's gonna make. If you don't know how much power it's gonna make, it's gonna make it very difficult to reverse the math and figure out what the fuel flow is gonna be. Uh, another advantage is since we're working on, I think I touched on this already, but since we're basically working on a scale of 30 to 130, uh, we know roughly what the numbers are going to be, the numeric values in the table. So if you're looking and you have a spot where you see your VE goes from 100% to 240%, it's very easy to spot that. As to where if you go from you know, 800 pounds to 1,100 pounds of fuel flow, uh, yeah, that's a big jump, but it's not necessarily that far out of line. It's gonna be a lot more difficult to spot it, basically because every combination is gonna have numbers that are significantly different as to where every VE combo out there is gonna have numbers that are relatively similar. Uh, so when you see something that's out of line, it's, it's much easier to spot. And of course the battery's gonna die, god damn it. All right, let's take a look at a couple of things in the software of some other examples. Uh, so right now we're in speed density. So we're in pounds per hour. If we look at the fuel graph, you can see it, there's not, it's not really much of like a graph and everything is constantly going up. Uh, if we switch over to speed density, I'm sorry, volumetric efficiency, uh, you can see it never seems to really do all the math 100% right when you switch over, so be aware of that. Just do that so it looks pretty normal. But you can see there's actually like a shape to this. Uh, and you can tell looking at this that this engine is going to make peak torque at about 5200 RPM. And then it's going to slowly roll over after that. I find that this makes tuning everything significantly easier. And if we go here, so we're in VE mode now. So if we go to target air fuel ratio, and let's just set all of this to 11.5. That's all that has to happen. Uh, all of the table values are exactly the same. Now, if we go back to speed density, target air fuel ratio, now we do all this to 11.8. Let's see when we click on something else, it's gonna bring up this warning. And basically it's gonna ask whatever the percentage difference was between what the air fuel was and what the air fuel now is gonna add that much additional fuel to the fuel table. So if you click no here, then it's not going to reach the desired air fuel ratio because the fuel table values are incorrect. Closed loop might make up for it, but basically you have to hit yes here and you have to have it change all of the pound per hour values. And so if that math isn't done correctly, you could be away from your target. And either way, like if you wanted to try a handful of different air fuel ratios, you're gonna be going up and down and up and down in this table. And sometimes it can make the graph ugly. Um, but either way with VE, you can change the target air fuel ratio and the table value doesn't have to change at all. Now, if we go to my favorite part of VE, so you can see here, what's this, 16 pounds of boost, we're at 272 pounds per hour of fuel, and it continuously goes up with more boost. If we switch back to VE, and we look at these values, there's a very small difference here. So we're basically gonna say from like 15 PSI all the way up to 45 pounds of boost, the table values are exactly the same. Just that in itself, like you've eliminated really having to modify half of this table. And it doesn't always work out where the values are exactly the same, but it's really close. So you might get up to 35 pounds and you might need to plus or minus a couple of percent of fuel. Uh, but either way, like once you get past this point here where you're basically transitioning uh, from manifold pressure into boost, uh, and this will range a little bit, but usually somewhere in this like five to seven pound range. Uh, once you get past that, you can almost, you know, kind of take this value at seven pounds. Go here, so we can highlight from seven pounds all the way up. Uh, this is V1 software, so we still have to fill column values. 
again, it, it jacked the math all up, uh, going back and forth from BE to speed density. Um, but you get the point. Uh, all of these table values can be very, very similar. But yeah, just, just that in itself makes VE worth its weight in gold to me. So one other thing is since air temperature is part of the VE equation, theoretically, if you go to temperature enrichment, air temperature enrichment, uh, you know, this can be 100%. So it's a little bit weird if you're not familiar with it, but some of these percentage-based enrichments, 100% would be, there's just a thousand people that come here all day, every day. So even though this is 100%, it's basically equivalent of no correction. So 101% would be adding 1% of fuel, 99% would be taking away 1% of fuel. But this math is already being done for us in the background. And one more thing to take into consideration is just because you're using volumetric efficiency doesn't mean that you lose the ability to monitor your fuel flow in pounds per hour. Uh, you can still data log it as you can see here. And if you want to do even less math, you can also log estimated VE, which is basically telling you the cell that you're in. Let's see here, these, these files don't match, but uh, so you can see we have our dot here. So it's basically telling us that this cell here, you can see it's in between some, so you gotta use a little bit of judgment there, but it's telling you that those that the table value should be this value here. Again, those two files don't match, so the, the, the math is nowhere near right, but you get the point. You can see here's the closed loop compensation I was telling you about. So basically we're 4% off, so this number would be 4% away from what the actual table value is. And you can see here, like I was mentioning before, when we go up an RPM, the fuel flow increases the whole time. However, if we look at the estimated VE, once we get past peak torque, the numbers start coming back down again. So now we can go over the cons of volumetric efficiency. So basically, there are no cons. <laughs> To me, the, the advantage of VE is just night and day over the other options. But I guess if you wanted to get technical, um, there's a ton of math going on uh, behind the scenes with volumetric efficiency. So there needs to be a level of trust with the ECU manufacturer and then the injector manufacturer's data, uh, you know, your air temperature sensor, your math sensor, all of those things. You, you have to have a lot of faith that that stuff is correct. If it's not correct, then the VE numbers will be very incorrect. The more incorrect the data in is, the more incorrect the data out is. So, you know, basically shit in, shit out. But the nice part is even if the table values are incorrect, we're still outputting an injector pulse width. So as long as that pulse width is correct and it's delivering the correct amount of fuel, it doesn't really matter that the VE numbers are incorrect. In a perfect world, we'd obviously like them to be correct, but if they're off 10, 20, 30, 100%, it kind of doesn't matter. The the flow of the table is going to be the same. It's still going to roll over uh, with peak torque. It's still going to do all of, all of the things that it needs to do. Just the actual value in the table is going to be a little bit different. So basically the way that I view this is we have this complex ECU that's capable of doing a whole bunch of math very, very quickly and far better than I'm capable of doing it. So I would prefer for the ECU to do the math based off of the input that I give it, rather than me having to manually do the math for everything. Uh, to me, that makes more sense. I guess it's kind of like speed density and using fuel flow and in just simply injection time is like banging a carburetor with a hammer or whatever it is that you do to tune those things. Uh, and then volumetric efficiency is just more modern. It's taking advantage of the things that we have available, like driving a Tesla and how they can put down 1,500 foot-pounds of electric torque instantly without spinning the tires. It's just a more modern way of doing it. I guess another way you can look at it is speed density in pounds per hour is like using your, your phone calculator, you know, vertically. Volumetric efficiency is like you turn your calculator sideways and it's like a whole new world. I've probably said 100 times I personally prefer volumetric efficiency. Um, I would actually love to hear anyone that prefers speed density, what their reasoning is. Uh, again, there's no right, there's no wrong, it's just all personal preference. I just don't think that there's anything that anybody could say that would change my mind that VE isn't what I want to use and that speed density is. So if, if you're in that speed density corner, uh, please let me know what it is that you like about it. Yeah, I, I'd be curious to know.
different people prefer different things. And I think it's awesome that Holly gives us the opportunity to use whichever fuel calculation method it is that we want. It opens a lot of doors, it keeps everybody happy. And uh, you know, who knows, maybe I'll get bored and I'll just start playing with one of these combo deals just cause why not? Uh, it's there, why not use it? I really tried to keep this video as beginner friendly as I could. Hopefully I didn't fail too miserably at that. Uh, if there's any part of this that you'd like me to break down further or simplify or get more complex with, just let me know. As always, I appreciate you guys watching and uh, I will see you on the next video.